It's good to have Mike and Tiffany Jones here. They uh, recently were credentialed with the Assemblies of God. I got to be a part of that interview process, and they're just a great couple. Uh, they're, they are ministers now, youth pastors, uh, here in series on uh, a, a Grace Community, right? Uh, and it's on Service Road, and they've uh, been there for a little bit with uh, serving with their best friend. But they're here visiting with us, checking out, seeing what we do. So everybody be on your best behavior, all right? <laughs> Act like you're, you're just like, you, you know what to do. You know what to do when they come, all right? So <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you guys here. Thanks for coming today. So you may not know this, uh, but during this year, uh, n nearly the entire year, we've been in a series. Now, usually when I'm in a series... I'm telling you, like we are in the series and this is the part. And I really haven't told you that we've been in a series, but it's been a series called The Garden of God, or we've called it God's Grove. And we just really never, I just never really threw it out. And, but here's the thing, because of our name being Hope Tree Church now, I just, just had this spirit feeling inside that said, let's, uh, let's just teach on whenever we see trees in the Bible, plants in the garden. Uh, plants in the Bible, gardens in the Bible, how things grow in the Bible. So all year long, you have been getting a steady uh, diet of how to grow in your faith. And that's what we've been uh, working on. Last week, I preached a sermon I thought that I'd never preach. Uh, and I remember coming across this verse about 15 years ago, it kind of stuck in my head. And I thought, well, this might make a good sermon one day. And uh, I, I always wondered how, but it fit into this little series that we had. Uh, anybody remember what it was called last week? Yeah. Death in the pot. The poison in the pot. Oh, it's one of those unusual, okay, you don't usually have a title like that. But it was about how we were, well, how we as Christians can add wild boars. We had poison to what Jesus has for us. Jesus has something pure for us, and we think, oh, we got to add all this and all that and all this other <laughs> extra stuff. And Jesus says, just get me in your life, and I'll fix your life up. Yeah. All right? And so that was... Uh, this week, though, we're, we, uh, we come to what I believe will be the final time that we will be uh, speaking on this particular topic, uh, for this year at least. And uh, as we're coming to Revival Days, after Revival Days... We've got a whole new series that is going to, we're going to be focusing on the Holy Spirit and the importance of having him in our lives. That this is more than book club. This is actually having God a part of your life and him changing your life and able to change others' lives. And that's what the Holy Spirit can do for you and for all of us. But uh, as we approach this, the end of this series, today we're going to come to two famous gardens in the Bible. We're going to discuss two famous gardens in the Bible, and you're, you know what they are. You're probably, familiar, you're probably familiar with them, but this will be a fitting finish to our series, all right? This is, we're not going to go out with the crash. We're not going to go with the bang. We're going to go taking a nice walk through the garden. Sound good? All right. So for the first garden, I want to take you back to the original one, the Garden of Eden, and we're going to compare and contrast the stories in, uh, of this garden to the next garden that we're going to look at. But in order to do that, we need to open our Bibles today. We're going to be doing that quite a bit, so keep your Bibles handy. We're going to go to chapter 2 of Genesis. So the first book in the Bible, chapter 2. And we'll start off with verse 8, 9, and then we're going to skip uh, to, to verse 15 in just a moment. But here we are, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 8. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree, to, a tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and moving to verse 15 it says then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat 
But of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. If you've been in church uh, for any of any amount of time, okay, you've heard this story. You've, you've heard the story of the Garden of Eden and how the serpent, who was the devil, who would eventually deceive Eve and Eve, Adam, to take from the tree that God had said, do not eat. And we, uh, e even, even people who um, aren't <coughs> coming to church on a regular basis, I would say most of them have heard the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Was it an apple? I don't know. Okay, I have no idea. I feel like it's a passion fruit. Because a passion fruit looks really <coughs> amazing on the outside. And then you eat, you eat it and you're like, meh. That's what sin is. Sin looks really appetizing and really cool, and then you do it, and you're like, eh. You're left, you know, desiring more. Um, and that's what sin will do. But um, So Adam and Eve, we, we, we know the story of how they disobeyed God. They listened to the voice of the devil and decided that their will to become wise in their own eyes, to have forbidden knowledge, superseded the will of God. The will of God. We're going to be focusing on that today. They took the fruit that was forbidden, they ate it, and then they fell out of relationship that they had with God. God used to come down into Eden and walk with them, with Adam and Eve, and talk with them, converse with them, have a relationship with them. And then they did this, and it broke the relationship. Anybody ever done something that has broken a relationship in your life? And I would imagine that. God was very disappointed that he had created them, had this relationship, and then all of a sudden it's broken, created them, gave them a garden, gave them an opportunity to be in his will, to stay in his will. But instead of abiding in the kingdom, instead of abiding in, in, in obedience, they listen to their desires. Folks, that's when we get in trouble, when we start listening to our desires, our own desires. It was like, oh, this is the way. They, 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 they listened to their own desires. They allowed their emotions to dominate their minds. They lit their desire for what they just had to have. Oh, I just got to have it. If I could just have this, if I just did this, if I'm just going to be have this small little indiscretion over here, they allowed that to poison their minds, and they began to justify doing the things that they wanted to do. Well, this is the reason I did this. This is the reason I'm this way. This is the reason I took of the fruit. They begin to justify the sin in their, their minds. And, and we could point at Adam and Eve and say, look at you, but that's what we do. We do something, and then we justify why we did it. And that's a dangerous place for us to get to. We as followers of God, people who believe in Jesus, we can often say like Adam and Eve did, forget all this Bible stuff. Forget all the stuff that God said was right and what God said was, was wrong. Just forget about it. Forget about what that crazy pastor in a shiny suit says to me every Sunday. It ain't, I don't, I don't need it. See, now here's, I'll say this. God gave us a free will. Amen. Okay? He gave us a, the free will to, to choose to follow him or, or to choose to disobey him. We, we, we follow him or, or, or we don't. We, we do, he, he gave us his free will. And, and because he made us with this ability to obey or disobey or to love or, or to hate, because of that, there's the opportunity of sin. And there, everybody's like, well, why didn't he just you know, make us to just be perfect and not have that free will? Okay? Do you, when it comes to love, if you force somebody to love you, are they really loving you? I mean, if you go to North Korea where you're forced to love Kim Jong-un, okay, are, are you really loving him? No, you're forced to love him. God gave us a choice. Yes. The, the problem with free will is a lot of people think, well, I can either obey or disobey, love or hate. It's a 50-50 thing. Is it really? 
Okay, is it ever really a 50-50 thing? Well, I might obey this time and I might disobey. Okay, based on how you know who you are, do you think there's a 50-50 chance that you'll end up on the right side? Man, we, we have a tendency to choose the wrong so often, so frequently. We're just, it's something that we're unfortunately good at. It's our human nature, our sinful nature, and it creates a desire in us to do what's wrong, to do what's wrong, mm -hmm. to do what we want, to do what we desire. And we stop looking for God's will, and we start to find our own stuff in our life. To we, we follow our own will to and to our own ruin. Can I just say that? Right. Once you stop following God's will and you start saying, "I'm going to do what I want to do," it's to our ruin. Right. To our ruin. When I was uh, when I was young, four or five years old. Really young. Um, I still remember all the times that me and my sisters, we'd play and have fun. But, I, had, of course, we had lots of toys. And among the many toys I had was this puzzle. Now, it wasn't one of those, you know, thousand-piece puzzles. It was one of those kindergarten puzzles. Big pieces. The kind of puzzles I still like, all right? Don't give me the little pieces. Oh! Man, frustrating. Give me the big pieces. You're like, oh, that is so easy. Yes, come on. All day long. And so I would have a, a farm puzzle like, like this one. And, uh, you know, it was easy. Well, the thing is, when you put it together, it created a scene. So it made it easy. You knew when you got to the end, because when all the puzzle pieces were in place, there was a picture that it created. Each piece has a particular shape that fits in with the others and the other pieces. And until every piece was in place, the puzzle wasn't complete. Each piece is important to the whole thing. Each piece is important to the whole thing. The purpose of the piece is the picture. The purpose of the piece is not the piece. Are you following me? Yes. Are you following me? If the peace gets so fixated on itself, if the peace says it's what I want to do, it's my desires that must be fulfilled, not only do you interrupt the purpose of the picture, you interrupt the purpose of the peace. Right. You're the peace. Okay, if you haven't got it, you're not following me, you're the peace, all right? <laughs> and we all play a piece in the big picture of God. And when we start focusing on the big picture of God, on God's will, then we could be a part of his picture. But when we start saying, no, I'm a piece and I'm the most important thing here, and what I want is what I should be doing. And when you do that, you, you, you kill the purpose of the picture, of God's overall picture, and you've killed your purpose. Because you're a piece. You have one purpose. But you're like, I don't want that purpose. I want my purpose. I want my desire. And we, we get ourselves in, into trouble. Listen, you're not the piece. You're not the picture. I'm not the picture. We're all just pieces of this puzzle. Which brings me to the second part and the major part that we're going to be studying today, the second garden. Okay, so we've seen the first garden. We've seen two individuals who said, who said not your will, my will be done. And they followed their will. And because of that, we have what we have today, a sin nature. We have a whole society filled with people who just want to do what they want to do. Instead of focusing on what, what God would have us do. So, <clears throat> we go from the first garden to the second garden. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark, chapter 14. Everybody just about there? Okay. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to the, his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, 
even to death stay here and watch. She went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. This is, a, this is our next garden. This is a deeply distressing garden. Jesus enters into this place called Gethsemane. When we look back to the Hebrew, the Hebrew is just, it's an olive press. So we know that this is a place uh, of olives in other accounts. The other four gospels, they call it the Mount of Olives. So we know that this is an olive garden. This is where Jesus came. At this point in his life, Jesus is about 33 years old. 33 years old, he spent the last three years teaching his disciples, performing miracles, doing things that we can't do. Okay? He was... He's capable of teaching in ways that we can, in, in, in doing these miracles and feeding the 5,000 and healing the sick and restoring blind to those who, restoring sight to those who were blind. But see, Jesus came here with more than just things that he could do because he was God. He came here with a purpose, and that purpose is the will of God. He came not just to be a Messiah that was prophesied about, not just to be king of the Jews, which he easily could have been. But he came here to perform an unselfish act, right. an act of sacrifice that would bring us back yeah. into relationship with God. That was his purpose. A lot of people read the stories. Oh, man, all these cool things that Jesus did. But without the fulfilling the purpose of him being a sacrifice that brings us into relationship with God again. So one garden took us out of relationship and the garden that we're going into is one that begins to help us restore that relationship with God. All four Gospels have the account of Jesus praying in the garden, all giving different kind of information. Because if we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all coming from different witnesses, different people. So you're going to see slightly different. It's, it's like if you went to a court and you had four people who saw a particular um, crime committed. All four of them will give you different, different details. They may come into the... Same conclusion and same facts, but they're giving you different details. And so we see different details in, in the gospel. And so we'll see this. I want to look at one more account in uh, the book of Luke. And let's go there to chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I love the sound of pages turning. I know a lot of people, most people have their digital phones and stuff, but it's still good to hear those Bibles. I love it. Don't feel, I didn't, okay, nobody better walk out of here offended. Oh, man, he didn't like my Bible because it's on my phone. That's not what I'm saying. Knock it off. Okay. We got people here. Don't, don't embarrass me, all right? <laughs> all right. Luke chapter 22. And uh, we're going to read all the way, let's see, from 35 to 46. Louie, keep up for me, would you? All right. You're going to have to put on your running shoes. <coughs> and he said to them, talking about Jesus, he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, look, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Yes. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood <laughs> falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. So the remainder of the message today will be focused on 
deep diving into, into this section. Before we, before we do that, though, um, this is what I want you to focus on. We are now out of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of my will, and now we've moved into the Garden of the will of God. The Garden of the will of God. And before we start deep diving into scriptures that we just read, can I just say from a human perspective that the will of God can kind of seem scary. Okay, I'm just going just gonna to be up front with you. And some of you already know this. The will of God can, can seem like one of the scariest places on earth. It's unknown. It's unknown. We don't know what, what God's will has for us. We, we know what we have for our plans, but we don't know what God's will is. So it can be a, can be a scary place. One of the reasons it can be scary is his will is not always our will. Anybody ever come to that? The will of God can be scary because there's change involved. God's going to say, I've got you here, but now that you are ready to do things my way, some of these things are going to have to change. You may lose some old relationships, lose the, uh, a path that you were on because you're moving over here into, into my will. And that can, that can be scary. If there's anything that humans hate, it's change. Okay? Oh, yeah. You laugh because you know. <laughs> yeah. Change can be a scary thing. Big or small, doesn't matter. If it's a big change, if it's a small change, we hate it all. Uh, maybe it's a job change. Anybody that ch changed jobs recently? Man, that's tough. Man, I, I remember. I, now, I, I usually would stick around in my jobs for long time, long, long periods of time. But when you switch jobs, you had to learn all sorts of new policies, what to do, who's expecting what. Man, that's a change that... That, you, that first day on the job, stress, all right? So much stress, that change would, would kill you. Or maybe, um, maybe you didn't change your job. Maybe you're at the same job, but the boss changed. Come on. Okay, that's one of the worst. That's one of the worst. Now you got the guy coming in or the gal coming in. And you have no idea what he or she wants, what they what they expect, what you know. Is it going to be a lighter load? Is it going to be a heavier load? Okay, that's a change that we don't we don't like. A big change is when people go through um, a relationship breakup or a divorce. Okay, that's that's one of the hardest things because then a lot of things are changing. A lot of things are changing. Often the hardest part. Of that is not that we've. Um, it's not so much when we go through that relationship breakup. It's not so much that we've lost what's been in the past. We've also lost what we've been imagining the future would look like. Am I hitting anybody? Whether it be a death in in, in your family or a divorce or a breakup or whatever. The past. <coughs> You've lost, you feel like you've lost a little bit of that, but you also have lost this future. That's a change nobody wants. Nobody wants that, that kind of change. And those are the big things. Okay? We hate it when big changes like, ha that, like that happen. But um, there's the little changes, too. Little changes can bother you. Like, for instance, you have plans with somebody else, and you're about to go. And then you get the text, I'm 30 minutes late. A little bit of a change. Anybody okay with that one? <laughs> That's great. No! That's almost as irritating as getting a new job! What happens if you go to your favorite restaurant and you look at the menu and there in front of you, they've changed the menu and your favorite chimichanga isn't on there anymore? <laughs> Anger! Right? Really frustration. You know what? Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the biggest change I hate seeing these days is every time I pass the ARCO a and PM, it's never a good change. It just, it just keeps going up. These are bad changes. Change is scary, okay? That, that's the thing. Why is the will of God scary? Because we don't know what he's going to be taking us into. 
there's a change coming. We know that when God says, uh, if you're going to follow my will, it's this way, and it's probably, I'm going to have to leave some stuff here. I don't like it. But when we do that, it can be a scary moment. Other times that we're scared of God's will can because, become because of the sacrifice. The sacrifice that it's going to take for us to do God's will. And, and let's, let's be honest, most of us, if not all of us, want a Christianity that is painless. Okay? Everybody, everybody wants the cure to the disease. Nobody wants the needle. Nobody wants the, the, the thing that's going to help cure you. No, nobody wants to go through that. Some of us don't want to drink of the cup of the will of God. Like Jesus was, was saying in the garden, if, it, if this cup can pass from me, if, if, if there's another way I could take of another cup, of another path, is there another direction? Can we go that? And that's the thing is we, we as people who are followers of God, we often don't want to drink of the cup of the will of God. Sometimes it's just as simple as the will of God is an inconvenience to us. Okay? Sometimes it's just it's just just a little bit of an inconvenience as and, and we could bristle at that. Like a small change in my life. In order to be in God's will, there has to be a small adjustment. Okay, we get upset about that stuff. Alright? And then there are times when the will of God is going to cost us, require us to sacrifice time. Money, effort, a desire that we have, a dream that we have. We often leave that behind when we're following the will of God. And, and you know what? Sometimes that, that dream, let me just say this. <clears throat> Many of us have these dreams of things that we thought we were going to do, that we want to do. And God says, that's a good dream. I've got a better dream for you. Right. And yet that dream... That dream is, is still there. And, it's, and guess what? It's almost going to be in the back of your mind. Oh, come on, God. Don't take me down this road. I, I want to do this. That's the better way. That's the easy way, the convenient way. That's my dream. And sometimes when we step into the will of God, we, we will have to sacrifice. Man, sometimes we sacrifice peace at night. I know some people are like, oh, man, God's will can give you peace. But sometimes you walk into it. And it's so scary and frightening to you that for that first moment, you're like, is this the right thing? I don't know. I'm losing so much. It could be a scary place. But may I say this, the measure of your trial, the measure of the change that you're going through in order to be in God's will is also the measure of how much God trusts you. If God's asking you to do something big, something crazy, Something that doesn't make sense. If he's pointed you in that direction, well, then he's, he's trusted you to do it. Yeah. He's trusted you to do it. Some of you have gone through some amazing, amazing trials. And I'm, by amazing, I mean not in a good way. <laughs> like tests of your life that have just been awful. Things that you've gone through. Some of you are in the middle of it. Maybe even right now. You're going through this test of your faith. Or you've lost something. You're trying to figure everything out. But you're wanting to get into God's will. Can I just say this? The reason you went through that. The, we, the reason you're in this right now. Is because my Savior. Has entrusted you. With this heavy burden. And I can't give you an answer to why he does that. I can't, I can't give you an answer to why he chose you to go through what you're going through right now. I can't give you. I wish, I wish I had all the answers. I wish I could just tap into, you know, I could just, you know, run a cord, an Ethernet up to God's hard drive and understand it for you. Only one person does understand it. He does. And we don't. All I can tell you is what I have seen throughout my life.
When God gives you a burden to carry, a weight on your shoulders, a trial to endure, it's because he has entrusted you. Not just trusted you, he's entrusted you. He wants you to carry it now and carry you carry it in the future because he knows that you are able to carry it into God's will. I don't know what that's going to look like. But we get to this place in our life when God changes things and we have to sacrifice and we have to give things up. <coughs> And this is where many people of the faith, many of us as Christians, this is where we bail. Okay? This is where we pull the parachute and we say, we're done. We're done with God. We're done with the church. We're done with the will of God. We're done with everything. We take the path of Adam and Eve and we say, my will be done. Instead of thy will be done, we say, my will be done. This is where we bail. Because it's a burden that's too heavy. We get to that point, don't we? Yeah. When the burden's too heavy. And I'll say this. I've seen many people here in this church stand strong uh, in ways that are encouraging to this pastor. And uh, I'll say this. Just because it looks easy doesn't mean the weight isn't heavy. There are people in here who make it look easy, but the weight that they carry. So be praying for each other during this time. But I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm a wandering today. Wandering through, through this. So hang with me. Back to the garden of the will of God. I'll say this. When it comes to being in the will of God. This is the place that I want to be. Okay? Now, is it scary? Yeah. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it something that sometimes I don't want to do? Absolutely. <clears throat> but when you're in the will, listen, I'd rather be in the will of God on the front lines of Israel right now than I would out of the will of God over at Pismo Beach. And you're like, that's a really nice place. And I wouldn't mind being there right now. And brothers and sisters, I would love to be there right now. But I'd rather be in the will of God in the line of fire. And here's the reason why. If it's God's will for you to accomplish something in his kingdom, doesn't matter what you're going through, he's going to give you what you need to accomplish it. He's going to give you what you need. And you're like, how am I going to get there from here? You know how often throughout the week, I, as, as I'm planning for the church and planning for different parts of the church, how are we going to get there? Who's going to do this? How are we going to support this financially? How are we going to? And then I have to stop and think, when has God let me down? When I'm in his will, his will will be done. Okay, His will may derail my will. Okay, I may have a plan. I may have a desire. And then it doesn't happen, and I'm upset. God, where are you? He's like, it's not my will. Okay, I derailed that because that's not my will. That's not going to fit into my future plan. God's going to give you what you need to accomplish the will that he has for you in your life. If you need direction in your life, get into God's will because he'll give it. If you need safety and protection in your life, get into God's will because he will give it to you. Okay? If you need, maybe you need shelter. Maybe you need a financial miracle. You get into God's will, and you're like, but if I get into God's will, it's going to cost me this. But once you get into God's will, the provision will be made. He will provide for what you need at that moment. He, every single time. Okay? Now, that may mean you, you have to live his way. Okay, I'm just going to give you this. <laughs> Some of you are not going to like it. <laughs> but sometimes his will just means living his way according to his rules and not your rules. You can get mad at me. I'm just, I'm, I'm just giving it to you from here. But sometimes we have to live by his rules, not our own rules. These things, all these things, all these provisions, all these things, they, they, they can all be yours in God's will. 
the provision, the safety, the, the, the financial miracle that you need, the love that you feel like, they can all be yours in God's will if you're willing to get into that place. These things, they can all be yours. In fact, God, may, maybe God's trying to get somebody's attention right now saying, quit living your way. You've tried that way, and it just keeps failing. You keep, you keep trying it, and then you mess up, and it's like, well, maybe if I just try this again, it'll work this time. And you step out and on your face again, okay? I'd say, raise your hand if you're do, doing this right now, but I'm not going to do that, okay? You already know who you are, who we all are. We try to do things our way, and then we fall on our face. And sometimes God's will is just saying, quit it. There's a better way to do things. There's a better way to do life. Get into my family. Get into my word. Start talking with me. Start spending more time with me. I will bring you into a better life. And it's a relationship with him. You know, a lot of people think, that, and this is what causes a lot of divorces, and I don't mean to step on anybody's toes, but a lot of people divorce because this doesn't work, so I'm going to go into this relationship and try to find it. And you have to leave this behind to get into this new relationship. And, and, of course, sometimes, you know, you're not finding it. But what God is saying is you're in a relationship with yourself. Okay? You ever know somebody who's in love with themselves? All right? They're just great people to be around. But you, you're in love with the way that you do things. And God says, listen, I got a better way. You may think it's going to hurt you. And you may think it's going to cost you. And it might be scary. You might have sacrificed something. But, listen, you come over here. You come over to my track. And I will give you exactly what you need for all situations. I will give it all to you. His, take on my principles. Take on the way that I want you to do life. Do things my way, God says, because he sees that your current life is falling apart. That you're stressing out over everything. He says, come on over to my side. And now, now some of you are like, okay, I keep hearing you say the will of God, the will of God, the will of God. Will of God. What does that mean? Is that like a you know last will and testament? No, no, no. It's what he wants for your life. And he's like, well, how do I get into God's will? And it says it in the verses that we just read. That Jesus came to the garden as he was accustomed to doing. Now, why do you think that Jesus came here to the garden so often? To uh, pick olives? all season. Or maybe he came to the garden because there's a nice quiet place where he can rehearse all the things that he was going to tell the Judas the next time he saw him. Or maybe he was just there in the garden laying, watching the clouds go by, turning them into shapes of animals just to mess with the disciples' heads. You know, that's not why he went into the garden. He went into the garden to pray. Okay, this is God in the flesh, Jesus, spending time praying to the Father. He came here to this garden to pray. To be in the will of God, you're going to need to spend more time in prayer. To get new direction in your life, you're going to need to spend more time in prayer. To be closer to the God who loves you and the God that you love, you're going to need to spend time. That was weak. All right. Getting to some of you, all right? Somebody's going to need to watch the replay. Throw the, throw the challenge flag, buddy. In order for you to get into the will of God, you're going to need to spend more time in prayer. Super easy. And this is why I wanted to finish this series with this particular topic because to be you, we need to get into the will of God and we need to spend more time in prayer and if we're going to have the revival days that we want and if we're going to study the Holy Spirit and what he can do in your life you're going to need a better relationship with the Father it doesn't matter who you are Okay, I, I'm, not, I'm not, well look at me Chris I come here every Sunday and I dress really nice I don't care, you're going to have to pray more Okay, well I'm already praying, pray more well I'm not praying at all yeah, you need to okay? you're going to have to pray more for sure. The good news is if you're at zero, it's going to be easy to pray more. <laughs> but just to spend some time with God. And you're like, how do I pray? Simple. Talk to him like he's your father. Not like he's your Santa Claus. Not like he's your, you know, uh, genie in the lamp from Aladdin. Like he's, 
your heavenly Father who has a plan for your life, who loves you, who is wanting to protect you. Before I leave this point, I, I want you to hear and see this when it comes to prayer. You won't pray if you don't make time to pray and a place to pray. Okay, Jesus was accustomed. He had a routine of coming to pray. And he had a place where he prayed. Listen, you need to make a time to pray and you need to make a place to pray. You're like, how do, how do I get into this routine? How do I get into God's will? You're never going to do it with just shotgun prayer. Okay? When you have a break, okay, well, I'm on my way to work. I'll pray now. Oh, I've, got a, I've got a little bit of a break here. I'll, I'll pray now. Some of you, the only break you get is when you're in the bathroom. Don't pray there. All right, that's just weird. We're talking about the king of kings, lower lords. Would you do that? This is going to get me in trouble. Would you go to the throne of grace on that throne? All right, I'm just saying. I wouldn't. And I know, sometimes you sit and you're like, okay, I'm just going to uh, find another place to sit and talk to God, all right? But what I'm saying is this, whether it be daily, you know, you get three times a week, if, if you're, not, you're not doing it all, pick a spot. I, I've got several spots. I've got a, I got a place in, in my yard where there's like this semicircle, and I'm like, I ain't leaving this spot until you talk to me back, until I hear your voice. Or get there, there's, a, you know, a trail that's near our house in Waterford that you can walk, and it's, it's just a nice, peaceful place, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll go there to pray. Find a place to pray and then find a routine time to do it, okay? Otherwise, you won't get into it. You will not be able to get into the will of God until you find that place of prayer. All right, going back to Luke chapter 22. If you've got your Bibles open, great. Otherwise, it's on the screen. Jesus saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Did you know that there are angels ready to do the bidding of God in your life? It's, it's biblical. It's scriptural. I know that we Protestants, we Pentecostals, we don't talk about that too often. But it's true. All throughout the Bible, we see instances where angels come to the rescue of God's people. And they sent to us, they are sent to us in response to prayer. When you pray, God, God responds. We, we see it in the Bible. When Abraham was pleading with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, and what happens? An angel goes and saves the family of Abraham's nephew. Lot brings them out of the city. What, what happened when Daniel went to the lion's den? It says that an angel shut the mouth of the lions. They were hungry, like you guys are getting right now. They wanted to eat. Daniel. He was on the menu. <laughs> but an angel came and shut the mouths of the lions. And, and I don't know how many stories I've heard of people from my family, from my friends, from, from you guys who have said, man, something was happening. And all of a sudden, it looked like something bad was about to occur, like it was a car wreck or something was about to hit you. And then all of a sudden, something moved you. And you didn't know what. An angel... In response, response to your everyday prayers, going up to God and saying, this child of God is in the will, this can't happen. Get this angel to move this out of the way because this ain't happening. Listen, angels get involved in our lives. I know we don't talk about it because everybody's like, well, I don't want to be one of those weird people that write those books. But listen, angels get involved in, in our lives. They're ready to help you, ready to rescue you, ready to save you from a particular struggle. But but because we don't pray, the angels are like at the fire department right over across the street. You know where all those firemen are right now? Sitting in the, in the second story of that fire department, waiting for a call. Yeah. When you start praying, you're hitting the fire alarm up in heaven. And the firemen go into act, jump into action to come and rescue you. When you are praying, you're calling down the power of God and he's sending those angels into your life to do something. To work with you and to work on your behalf and the help that we need can come if we're taking time to talk with God. When we're praying to him, getting in tune with his will, those angels are ready to help you perform God's will 
in your life if you're ready to get into his will. And you do that by getting into this prayer life. <coughs> Verse 44 from that same chapter. And it says, talking about Jesus being in agony. He prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. To, to get into God's will, you're going to have to sweat it out. You're going to have to sweat it. You're going to have to put in some. This is, now, this is where a lot of Christians fail. Hold on now. Okay, I, I got past the frightened spot. You know, I, I was scared of his will, but I, I, could, I could jump into that. And, okay, I got to sacrifice something. Now, okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to have to. I'll sacrifice some time. Okay? If you didn't stop there, this is the, this is the place where you get off, where you sweat it out, where you got to have to work it out. Where sometimes when you do so many things to work something out and you you know that you're in God's will and it's still not happening and you got to put in more work and more effort. If there's anything that drives me nuts is when I thought I fixed something and it ain't. Yeah. yeah. And then the wheel starts to do, 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 do all the bikes. Okay. We prefer our faith on a couch. How are you saying, man, I'm in the will of God when you're on the couch with a paper plate of nachos that you just melted some cheese over in the microwave? Okay, you're taking the easy way, okay? To get to where you are, you got to put in the work. To get to where you need to be, you got to put in the work. Sometimes you're going to get door slammed in your faces. Sometimes you're going to have to be able to have the wisdom of God to say that's not the right opportunity. I don't know how many times I've gone through my life where an, a door opened. I'm like, that seems like a pretty good way to go. But I had to be in God's will to know that it wasn't. That if I would have gone that direction, I would have caused pain for me, for my family, and for everybody that was involved with that. I gotta know some, you got to know that there are some opportunities that aren't the right ones. These are the wrong positions. Sometimes you have to put in the long hours to get God's will done. God was ready to use me when I said, I'm willing to do whatever it is you want me to do. Yes. Did anybody hear that? Yes. God will use you when you say, I'm willing to do whatever it is that you want me to do. Yes. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, the work, the scariness, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. To do what it is that you want me to do. God was, God will be, listen, I'm not here to say that God's will is going to be easy. Okay? There's going to, going to be stress. There's going to be pressure. You're going to have to put in a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of pain. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be anxiety and stress in your life and tears. But I'll, I'll say this, I'll do it again and again if it means I'm in God's will. And that's the stance we all have to, have to be able to take. That we will do it again and again, whatever it takes. If God tells you to do it, you'll do whatever it takes. Because better for me that if the storm is raging, for me to be on a boat with Jesus than standing on the shore. Amen? And today Jesus is calling you deeper into the garden. Deeper into the garden. In all of the accounts that we read of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, all of them contain one fact, that Jesus went to the middle of the garden alone while his disciples stayed back here. And he said, do the work. Get this done. Fulfill the task. Pray that you won't enter into temptation. And all the accounts said, they went out. They weren't willing to walk on with Jesus all the way. Today, Jesus is calling us deeper in the guards. Listen, your name doesn't have to be written like the accounts uh, 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 of the disciples who said, I'll go with you, Jesus, but just this far. I'll go with you, Jesus, but no further than this. Jesus, I'll go wherever you want me to go, but I can't go any further because... Is that the account that you want written of your life? Or would you rather write a new account that says, I went in deeper. Amen. 
deeper into the garden. You don't have to say the same thing said about you that was said about the disciples. Don't wait for someone else to do the work. Don't sit back and rest when there's so much to do. Instead, get up. Follow Jesus deeper into the garden. You need to be you need to start praying more. Pray about the house that you want to buy. Pray about the business or the job that you want to get into. Pray about the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Pray about the college that you're deciding that you're wanting to do. Pray about everything. If you've got a decision to make, big or small, get God involved. Get, you need to go deeper into the garden where he is at. Okay? You want to know where Jesus is at? Deep in the garden. Keep walking till you find him. Keep walking. Keep praying. Keep going. Keep, keep doing what he's called you to do until you find him and find his will perfectly settled in the middle of the garden. Pray about the big decisions and the little decisions. And let me just say this. If you want God to be involved in your big decisions, start by making a part of your little decisions. All the little choices that you make in your life, and you think, oh, I could do that on my own. I just start praying about every decision that comes up. I'm not saying, well, should I turn left at this next stoplight or not? I'm not saying that. But you know what I mean? There's little things, little items that come into your life. Start praying about those. Because if you want God to show up on the big days, he's going to have to be there on the little days for you. Yeah. You're going to have to let him be a part of that if he's going to be on the big stuff. Yeah. All right? So today, Jesus is calling all of us deeper into the garden. And listen, if it matters to you, if there's a decision that matters to to you, if there's a decision to be made, find time to pray. Make time to pray. Make a place where you will pray and begin a journey into the garden of the will of God today. And we can all do that right now. Real simply. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, now, a lot of times, we just, okay, there's, a, there's usually an altar call, but I'm going to do something just a little bit different today. I just want to give you a couple minutes. I know, it's already new. You got the rumbling assembly. But I'm just going to give you a couple minutes. And for some of you, this is going to be weird because you, you haven't prayed. You don't know how to pray. You, you haven't taken the time to pray. But just for the next couple of minutes, can, can we just do this? And, and, and listen, you can pick a spot. Pick a spot. You can be up here in the altar area where we often come. Maybe it's just there in your chair, leaning over. Maybe you're the kind of person who, when you pray, you're in that, that Elijah contorted position where you're in a position of travail and you need Jesus to show up in your life. But there's a decision that we're all making. Today, you've got some, you've got some stuff going on in your head. You've got stuff going on in your mind, in your life, that you need Jesus to step into. So I'm not going to send you on your way with your homework assignment. We're going to do an assignment here in class. And I just want you, for just a moment, for just a few minutes, just bow your head, and whatever God's leading you to do, whatever decision you've got, get God involved right now. And again, you can come down here, you can pray right there where you're at. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to practice what we've been talking about. Can we do that? Many who are, who have been, you've entrusted with a heavy burden, a difficult decision, one that no one has chosen, no one wants to face this, and yet you've called, you've called them to this place. Help us not to turn to the left or to the right, try to figure this out on our own. Lord, you're in the middle of the garden here. Help us to just seek you. Help us to find your will. In Jesus' name. You are more than welcome to stay and pray. just a little bit different. If you would like to stay and pray, we'll just keep this going. Okay, Louie? Because I 
feel like there's still some people who you're breaking. Maybe you you need to come down here and say, I need I need some more time in prayer. So I, I, I want to offer that. This is I know some of you if you're new here, this is this is not how we do things, but I feel like. Jesus is just calling us to stay here in a place of prayer. And so I'll dismiss you in just a moment and you're free to leave. Let's do it reverently. We can all get together outside. I'll greet you there, but if you need some prayer, if you if you need just time with God, the Holy Spirit's here and He's intervening in some lives. And so I want to give you an opportunity to just stay here in that place. God, go with us. Bless those who have come and delivered us from evil. In Jesus' name.